As a finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. Good evening from the city of Lagos to you all, our professional colleagues, student members, and friends of the Institute of Total Accountants of Nigeria. I welcome you to another episode of ICANN on Air, your great platform for learning, powered by our Noble Institute, the Institute of Total Accountants of Nigeria. I'm your host for today, Tosin Yakimwomi. Please inform your colleagues and friends that the show has commenced. And you can be part of this show, Icon on Air, on all Icon social media handles. The Icon Facebook page, Instagram handle, and also on Icon YouTube channel. And today, Thursday, 8th February, 2024, we shall be considering another topic, internal control over financial reporting. And I have here with me a distinguished professional, an audit pundit, a partner, Assurance Services in PwC, Mrs. Obioma Uba, FCA, who shall be providing insights onto this topic. So tell your friends that this show has commenced and quickly be part of this show if you are not yet here. And like we usually let you know that this program affords professionals and business owners to showcase their goods and services at affordable rates. The reach of the program is global and we assure you you won't regret partnering with us. So sit back and relax. I'll be right back shortly with my guests after this time out. Stay tuned. As a finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. to ICANN on Air, a fresh episode on today, 8th February, and we are discussing today internal control over financial reporting. Our guest is right here in the studio, Mrs. Obioma Uba, FCA, uh, to discuss and dissect this topic uh, with us. Mrs. Obioma, it's a pleasure having you as a guest in ICANN on Air today. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. Uh, let me quickly take the abridged profile of our guest on the show, Obioma Uba FCA. Obioma Uba is a partner in PwC Assurance Line of Service. He supports PwC Nigeria leadership in engaging on regulatory matters. 
Obioma was instrumental in developing ICANN's draft internal controls reporting framework and represented ICANN in the SEC committee that prepared the SEC guidance for management reporting on ICFR. Her work in this area led her to chair the Financial Reporting Council Committee that worked to finalize the ICFR reporting framework for unlisted public entities and the practitioners framework. Ubima is currently the learning and education leader for West Market Area of PwC. Uh, my distinguished colleagues, and this is their brief profile of our guest on the show today. And without much ado, uh, let's quickly go straight into the business of the day, internal control over financial reporting. Uh, control mechanisms, whether preventive, detective, or corrective, are very important in the lives of individuals, corporate bodies, and government of nations. And having you as our guest on the show today uh, will grant our audience the opportunity to learn from your depth of knowledge and skills. So let's kick off this way. In simple terms, uh, internal control over financial reporting, what exactly does that mean? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, okay, let, let me start this way. Internal control, broadly, first of all, you know, it's that process that is designed to enable the company to achieve its objectives. And those objectives would be objectives around operations. So you're talking about operational controls, reporting, and compliance. So you can see that the reporting objective is one of the elements in the broader concept of internal control. So ICFR refers to the controls that have been specifically designed to address the risks related to financial reporting. So in, in simple terms, a company's ICFR will consist of you know, th those controls that are designed to provide reasonable assurance that the company's financial statements are reliable, uh, they are prepared in accordance with the relevant accounting framework, for instance, IFRS. But then again, as I must warn that ICFR has its limitations. Um, you know, it cannot provide absolute assurance due to, you know, the inherent limitations, uh, lapses in judgment, human failures. It can be circumvented, you know, by collusion or improper management override. So it doesn't guarantee, uh, guarantee fraud detection. And it cannot prevent or detect all misstatements as it does not cover every single control. Um, therefore, it can't be an absolute assurance. Um, however, management just needs to demonstrate its awareness of the limitations in ICFR um, by selecting, developing, and de deploying controls that minimize these limitations to the barest minimum. So that's what I can say about the ICFR in, in, in a nutshell. Wow, that, that's beautiful. I think uh, the summary you have just given us about ICFR uh, actually makes uh, all the audience here today to actually understand uh, the term internal control over financial reporting. Okay, so moving along, uh, listed companies were mandated to report ICFR in 2023. Our viewers want you to briefly share the Nigerian journey on the adoption of ICFR so far. Okay, thank you for that question. Nigeria connected with the desire to report on con internal controls. And I watch my words, not internal controls over financial reporting now, but internal controls back in 2007, um, when the Investment and Securities Act 2007 was enacted into law by the federal government of Nigeria. You know, section, section 61 of that act requires management assessment of internal controls and section 63 requires auditor reporting on those management assessments. Now that ISA 2007, I, I believe it was Nigeria's effort to reform corporate financial reporting and restore investor confidence. This was on the back of some major corporate failures that had happened, first of all, globally. You know, if you remember in early 2000s, we had failures of Enron, Tyco, International, WorldCom, and more locally in Nigeria, we had the Cadbury um, issue 
uh, you know, the issue of fraudulent reporting cadre that occurred in 2006. Now, all these things shocked the markets. So the generally, the corporate governance needed to be enhanced and uh, it specifically controls around the financial reporting. So in the US, the US Congress passed uh, the Public Company Accounting uh, Reform and Investment Investor Protection Act in 2002, which you popularly call the Sabans Oxley Act after the two people who signed it. So it was a federal law that had the very wide, um, you know, sweeping impact on auditing and financial regulations for public companies. So I hope to have the opportunity later on to maybe speak a little bit more about the Sabans Oxley Act. But just moving in on to where we are, how we got to where we are in Nigeria now. So following the ISA 2007, uh, subsequent laws in Nigeria also had similar provisions. So if, for instance, the FRC Act of 2011. Uh, which mandates, uh, mandated um, uh, report management assessment and independ independent um, attestation by the auditors. So in, in 2013, there about the CBN wrote to the banks and required them to make those submit the reports, in, you know, in accordance with the requirements of the Investment Securities Act. But none of these things could make people comply with the reporting requirements, um, and that was because there was no framework that had been established either for the reporters to uh, report or for the auditors and the practitioners to actually review management assessment. So there was no framework. This is where ICANN came in. So in 2014, in TRPPC, I raised this matter of compliance um, with the requirements at, uh, uh, in, in that committee, that's technical research and public policy. At that time, it was chaired by um, Mr. Ismail Zachary um, before he went on to become the ICANN president. So he was chairing that TRPPC at that time. So he requested a small committee to, to be established and I chaired that committee. So we focused on trying to come out with a, a, a technical guidance document. So we did that and we developed it um, on the back of the um, US reporting and several other guidance documents that we could find. So put that together and um, we decided to zero in on the term internal control over financial reporting. And this is because it's a predominant term that's used by companies that best encompasses those reporting requirements we're talking about. So we don't want to speak to the whole of internal, the whole breadth of internal control, because that would be covering things that are, you know, even whether the security man came to work or something. So we focused on internal controls over financial reporting, leveraged all of these things and developed the ICANN technical guidance document. It's still even hosted on the ICANN website. Um, now that guidance, um, you know, was re um, exposed, comments came in, the comments were factored in, and the finished work was then sent to FRC by ICANN in 2016. And that was one part. The other part was the management assessment, which was also developed by ICANN. And that was also sent to SEC for consideration and adoption. So eventually, um, in 2019, the SEC instituted, they set up a stakeholder group to consider those reports. They also had another separate document that they were also considering as well. Uh, but the ICANN document was a lot more robust. So that formed the basis for the SEC guidance that you see that was released later on in March 2021. Then the FRC set up a committee in 2021 and considered the ICANN technical guidance, and that formed uh, the basis for the um, guidance document that was then released by FRC in December 2022. And then FRC decided to go on and then um, issue also a management assessment similar to the data of the SEC, but to now cover the non-listed, non-public companies that had been, uh, that were not um, in scope for the SEC. So I checked that um, FRC, uh, um, FRC working group that then developed those uh, guidance for release. So in a nutshell, that's the journey you know, that is taken us to get to this point. It's indeed a long journey. It's indeed a long journey dated back to 2006, 2007, as you have just mentioned it. And for the fact that our restoration of investors' confidence amidst corporate failures is a major call for concern. Uh, okay, moving along. So in your response, you tried mentioning some parties some parties, uh, we have the management, the board of directors, or a part of which is the audit committee, external auditors, 
the CERC, FROCN, they are all involved in ICFR. What are their roles, the different roles regarding the adoption of uh, ICFR? Okay. Um, you know, the audit committee, that is that operating committee of a board of directors that is actually charged with the oversight of financial reporting and disclosure. Um, so given the audit committee's oversight responsibilities for financial reporting, a company's ICFR compliance program is typically overseen by the audit committee. So they should be reasonably knowledgeable. They should be informed about the evaluation process and management um, assessment. So it's, it's, it's common for the audit committee to receive that ICFR compliance reporting for consideration and discussion just as they would consider the financial statements and the internal controls reports at the audit committee meetings. Now, um, I know I know you've mentioned well still within even still within an organization, um, aside the audit committee, sometimes you have a compliance, like an ICFR compliance steering committee that can also set up, you know, to provide strategic direction over the execution of management's responsibilities that's supporting the audit committee. Um, sometimes you also even in an organization have like a compliance project management office, PMO, you know, that will just look at, oversee and manage the overall project plan and monitor the project status. So these are to all um, functions within the organization that support the audit committee in executing that mandate. The external auditor, you talked about that, you know, they are the ones that would, they're required to perform an independent assessment. They are the ones that will go and issue a, a report after they have evaluated management assessment and their own testing. They will then report, they're required to report and provide an independent assessment of their evaluation, uh, which would, for the entities that are required to report on ICFR, would go with, along with the, um, the opinion on the financial statements as well. Then we, you talked about the SEC and the FRC, and yes, those are regulators in this space. They are the ones who have set the guide, guidelines. So SEC has issued the, the guidelines for public companies. FRC has issued guidelines for the management for non-listed uh, companies. And then you have the FRC, which has, has the responsibility as um, you know, being responsible in the financial reporting space and has also issued the practitioner's um, guidance document for reporting on uh, internal control en engagement. So, um, so these are all the rules that they have. But you know, above all, I think effective stakeholder management is, is really crucial for the success of um, ICFR implementation. Wow, stakeholders management is very crucial, like you just said. And that's my next question is actually on the stakeholders interface. So it's on record that you you have provided some supporting or some kind of support to SEC and FRCA. And of course, in the course of your duty, you are also supporting companies in their respective adoptions. So from your interface with the different stakeholders, what did you see as the main challenge or the challenges you that companies will be faced with uh, in the adoption of ICFR? Are there areas for consent or challenges for the regulators as well? Okay, I, I think the more common um, challenges that, that are out there, one is knowledge gap. Um, so the, oftentimes the teams don't have the relevant knowledge and experience um, to develop and implement an ICFR pro program, you know. So it isn't just the, the first year, you know, when you deploy ICFR, but even going forward, how do you run the program? How do you continue to test? You know, because it's something that every every other subsequent year you need to report on. So that knowledge um, gap is there. Inadequate manpower um, is there. Shortage generally, that's affecting everybody. Um, you know the JAPA syndrome as well and all that. So um, there's need for extensive training to facilitate understanding and build knowledge. And then, of course, there's cost constraints. Um, you know, just the upskilling people, it costs money, um, the systems that you need in place. If you want to actually implement ICFR, have a system that supports the testing, the documentation and all that, it costs money. Uh, but also sometimes you have inadequate involvement of senior level because sometimes um, organizations look at these things as just there for, okay, so internal control, go and do that, internal control, go and do that. So that involvement of senior level management and board oversight 
um, in, 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 in ICFR implementation. Without that adequate leadership involvement, um, the risk of internal control efforts meeting the compliance requirements, um, not meeting the compliance requirements would tend to be high. Um, and again, without that senior level involvement, the real benefits of ICFR to the business may not be realized. Then uh, we've also seen people start late, very, very late, the entire process. Um, just maybe they, they want to start the year and all the preparation and then they remember, oh, there's ICFR. And that's when in the last quarter of the year, somebody comes up with, with, with oh, we need to start looking at ICFR. And of course, last minute collaboration with the auditors. Because the auditors, you need, you need to collaborate very early with the external auditors because they're going to need to do their own reporting. So if, for instance, you have a materiality, uh, they have a materiality, a number in mind for materiality, and you have a different number, then there's a problem there because what you consider to be material may for them be a material issue. Um, then insufficient you know, documentation of processes within organizations because you need the documentation to be able to extract you know, and then be able to test the controls. And then uh, just the difficulty in strengthening entity level uh, control. So I think these are the more common um, challenges that, and so I think to avoid it, you just start early, have a clear vision, get the experts that understand the regulations, leading practices and, um, and all that. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you for giving us those challenges and also providing a solution uh, to those challenges. Uh, in line with financial reporting, can you tell us the components of internal control framework that are out there? Okay. Um, by components of internal control framework, we mean what is required to achieve the three main objectives of internal control. Um, so the guidance documents that have been released by both the Nigerian SEC and the FRC are based on the COSO framework. Although it doesn't mandate COSO, but it is the basis of COSO. Now, COSO is a foundation for me of modern internal controls and fraud deterrence. It is so, it's so, um, it has, it so has, you know, the possibility for such wide application. And so this and it has been used to guide and develop other existing compliance frameworks. So that COSO framework, it establishes a direct relationship between the objectives of internal control, which I talked about earlier, and as I mean the operations, reporting, and compliance, and the components of internal control, which means those components represent what is required to achieve the objectives. So the components of internal control are those things that are required to achieve the objectives of, of um, internal and efficient internal control. And by that, that means control environment, risk assessment, uh, control activities, information and communication, monitoring. So those are the five components of internal control. Now, the COSO framework um, looks at this, these and then also looks at the organizational structure of that entity. So there are three things that is and it's interplay there. That relationship is usually shown in the form of a cube. So when people go online and Google the COSO framework and all that, they will see that it's really, really depicted in the form of a cube with the objectives there, the, the requirements, things that are required, the control environment, the components, the control environment risk assessment, etc. on one part. And then the structure, the organization structure, entity level, the division, the operating unit and the function. So those are really the components and the structure. Now the the that causal framework that these things are based on includes 17 principles, you know, 17 principles and points of focus for each principle. And those those, the interplay of this gives you that robust uh, um, framework for you to actually uh, assess uh, internal control. It's, I think it's scalable uh, for every size of organization. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a very good one regarding the components of internal controls. I'm sure our listeners and audience are actually following to understand uh, those components and to actually get to know the meaning of the components of internal control. Now let's go to responsibility, uh, internal control over financial reporting, who is actually responsible for what? So my question is, what are the guidelines for internal control over financial reporting? And who is supposed to be responsible for internal control over financial reporting? Okay. Um, 
In a nutshell, the management is responsible for establishing and maintaining a system of internal control over financial reporting. Okay, but if I may just summarize the, the, the when, when you say guidelines, um, in summary, when evaluating the reliability of the external financial reporting, management must first of all accept responsibility for the effectiveness of the company's ICFR. Management is responsible for establishing and maintaining those controls. Now, and it must base its evaluation, its own evaluation of the assessment, you know, of the effectiveness of the entity's ICFR on a suitable recognized framework. So you need to be guided by a suitable recognized framework, such as the COSO framework, and is, which is highly recommended, but not mandated. Then you must present a written assessment of the design and the effectiveness of the company's ICFR on a periodic or annual basis. So you must document, there must be a written assessment of that design. So you must do work, they must go through an evaluation process, and you must do, you know, you must summarize that and come out with that written assessment. That will be uh, subjected to review uh, by the independent um, auditor or practitioner. And then you must sign off on each annual or periodic report that's been filed, attesting to the, the accuracy of that report and all of that. So in terms of the, the so that the guidance document has been issued. We have it, it both, both the SEC and the, and the FRC have issued a guidance document. So in that guidance document, it touches on various things. It touches on the duty of directors and uh, on internal controls. I repeat again, management is responsible for establishing and maintaining that. And management's um, responsibility is to provide reasonable assurance. Reasonable assurance is not absolute assurance, but it is a, a best effort at, as in it is a, a level of assurance that is that it has a lot has been put into to get to that level of assurance regarding the reliability of that financial reporting. And management is responsible for maintaining the evidence, evidential matters, including all the documentation to support that the assessment and to provide you know reasonable support for that and also allow a third party such as the external auditor to consider the work that's done by management that guidance also requires certification so you need to certify and this certification is on an is individual by the chief executive officer and the chief financial officer they don't sign together they will sign individual certifications um saying that they have and making all the points certifying all the points that are listed in that uh, management assessment document. Again, that guidance talks about the duties of the directors um, in establishing policies, procedures, practices to ensure the safety of assets, accuracy of financial records and reports, and, uh, and, um, and the achievement of uh, corporate objectives. Then it, it requires, there's a, a section of that guidance document that requires management to perform an annual assessment and document that annual assessment you know this is this is this is not the certification now the certification is the is the certification of that assessment by the directors by the chief executive um officer and the and the chief financial officer but the board of directors itself would 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 issue a document that's you know speaks to the annual assessment and there are three statements they need to be making there that one you know they they they, they, they take responsibility for establishing and maintaining controls that they they identify the framework that they have used maybe they are referencing the um, sec framework or the or the frc framework and then they also give a statement and find the framework uh, in, in, you know they give a statement at identifying their own sort of assessment based on that framework and saying, well, okay, we think that we're effective or not, or there's a material weakness in the ICFR that they have identified. Uh, management exactly. is not permitted to conclude that the entity's ICFR is effective if there are one or more material weaknesses. So in a nutshell, that's sort of like the guideline that um, is there for, for ICFR. Wow, that's a beautiful response regarding our questions on responsibilities and I'm sure we have been able to hear from her the different officers of the organization that has uh, various or different responsibilities in terms of internal control over financial reporting. 
Uh, so let's quickly go on a short commercial. I'll be right back. Don't go away. We have a lot for you today. Stay tuned. The Executive Committee of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria invites you to London for its 11th International Conference to be held at the Hilton Kensington Hotel from the 13th to the 16th of March, 2024. Themed Cross-Border Integration for Economic Resilience to be delivered by seasoned speakers who are subject matter experts with global renown. Conference will explore amongst other topics, micro and macro factors necessitating cross-border integration. How international financial systems facilitates cross-border integration, artificial intelligence, and of course the role of the professional accountant. Conference highlights include special address by the 59th president of the institute, plenary sessions, interactive sessions, and networking opportunities with UK domiciled professional bodies and professional colleagues from across the world, a guided visit of a famous London landmark and a visit to Westfield London White City, the largest shopping and leisure destination in Europe. Conference resident delegates get a VIP pass with exclusive access and offers up to 25% discount on high-end brands. Make your reservations now by sending an email to conference at icon-org.uk for more information. London awaits you. Plan, prepare, be there. ICON UK Conference 2024 Yes, welcome back to ICON on Air. And today we have been talking about internal control over financial reporting. For us, for the last, in the last 30 minutes, we have been hearing from our guest on the show, Obioma Oba, FCA, a partner in PWC. And of course, he has been dissecting the questions and speaking a lot about ICFR. Uh, let's quickly acknowledge our audience in the house today, uh, especially those who joined us uh at exactly 6 a 6 p.m rather at exactly 6 p.m uh we have william william yeah william oloranti moreni kg oloranti moreni kg better blessing from lagos thanks for being part of this show today paul adequito paul adequito we acknowledge your presence in this program Olubenga k from abuja bide mi oloro mbia kenpelo from lagos Abidoye, ordinary day. Thank you for joining this program. Miriam Yusuf, watching from Abuja, Onoyi, Oyamenda. Thank you for being part of this show today. Uh, we also have uh, Sonny Abdulakim from Kano. Sonny Abdulakim, all the way from Kano. Kristana Eleojo, all the way from Akodi Benue State. We have a lot of uh, people joining us today. We have William on here. William, thank you for being part of this show. Samuel, Samuel Odonban, thank you. Uchena, Michael, and Rizzi. Kola Fagba, Mila. Follow the short Clement Olushagu from Edo State. We have Neye Guanoko from Lagos. We have Oye Tunjemu Iwa all the way from Ibadan, Oyo State. Chibuza Okorie, thanks for being part of this show. Uh, Samuel Akisogu from Oweri, uh, thank you for being part of this show. Lassisi Latif, Taiwo. Choson Olu Olu Soji from Abe Okuta in Ogun State. We have a whole lot of people joining this icon on air today, listening with rapt attention to our topic, internal control over financial reporting. Please send in your questions. Our guest is on the show to respond to your question. And trust me, she will provide the expected response. So let's quickly go ahead with our question. Uh, so uh, my next question for you. Is internal control over financial reporting applicable to private companies? If yes, how? And if no, why? Thank you for Thank that you. question. Yes, it's applicable. You know, uh, reliable information is vital, is it not, for a private company's strategic business decisions? And that is what the internal control over financial reporting is trying to help achieve. So insofar as reliable information is needed 
for a private companies uh, to meet its strategic business objectives, uh, then and, and to make decisions, then it is it is it is applicable. But um, it you know it it is not mandated. Um, you don't have to go and do the reporting and and all all of that. Uh, it would be beneficial to you. It's best practice. If you wish to report that way, of course, your 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 stakeholders will be happy for it. The, the regulators will be happy for it, uh, and, and and all that. But it's not um, it's not mandated. Um, the beauty of the coastal framework is that it's very scalable. Um, I've touched briefly on the frame on the framework. The principles, those principles. If you look at risk assessment or control environment or any of those principles, information and communication, it's something you can apply to any organization, even a sole proprietor, somebody who's just running his supermarket, I'm sure he, he, he would um, consider risk assessment, you know, in terms of perhaps maybe how he handles his um, cash and all of that. Perhaps the risk assessment, the location he is, the environment and all that would inform the decisions that you take around how you, you the businesses that, how you operate your business, how you how you pay in your cash, how much cash you hold, what whether you should locate yourself beside, for instance, an agent that can take cash off you and 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 give those out people as you know as a, as a, as a, as, a, as an agent an agent banking for instance. So what I mean is that it is it is the principles, the components, all of those things are so scalable. So every every body can actually apply ICFR and should apply ICFR. Um, no matter how small the company is. Thank you. I hope okay. I understand it. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think I can get your response that uh, yes, it is applicable, but not mandatory uh, for them. Yes. Uh, quickly. Sorry. I have uh, members also joining us uh, from uh, UK. Uh, we have uh, Lawat Idris joining us from UK. We have Sadiq Olatinju also joining us from London. Thanks for being part of this show. It also tells us that Icon on Air is also being watched across the sea. Okay, uh, let's move to the next question here. Uh, we want to have a better understanding of the relationship between internal control over financial reporting and the Surveillance Act of 2002. I remember you earlier mentioned it briefly, but you prayed mm -hmm. for time at that point in time that if you could still have time, you will discuss it, but I think this is the opportunity for you to tell us better about the relationship between ICFR and the Sovereignist Oxley Act of 2002. Okay. Thank you very much. So you remember earlier on, I said that the Sovereignist Oxley Act is a U.S. federal law that established uh, what I call sweeping auditing and uh, financial regulations for public companies. Now, Section 302 of that Sabon's Oxley Act, it pertains to corporate responsibility for financial re um, reports. So that Section 302 established um, that the CEOs and the CFOs must review all financial reports and that the reports are fairly presented and they don't contain any misrepresentation. That section also established that the CEOs and the CFOs are responsible for internal auditing, internal accounting controls. And that act requires year-end disclosure. And um, it also says it must contain reporting of material changes in financial condition. Then there's another section of section um, of the Sapan Zoxley Act, section 404. That one deals with the management assessment of internal controls and requires companies to publish details about their internal accounting controls and their procedures for financial reporting as part of their annual financial report. That section 404 uh, then requires corporate executives to, to personally certify the accuracy of their company's financial statements and make them individually liable if the US SEC finds violations. So you can see that it, it, it is very similar, you know, to some of the requirements that you find both in the Investment Securities Act and in the Financial Reporting Act. The Sabans Oxley Act created new requirements for corporate auditing practices that were not there. 
Uh, it requires public uh, corporations to hire independent auditors to review the accounting practices and define the rules of engagement for corporate audit committees and external auditors. Um, it also created rules for um, separation of duties by detailing you know, non-audit services that a company's auditor cannot perform whilst being the auditor. It led to the creation of the Public account Company Accounting Oversight Board. Now, that Public Accounting Oversight Board sets standards and rules for audit reports. And so, if you if you if you um, if you recall, there was the that uh, PCOB standard initial PCOB standard two that spoke to um, the requirement for the external auditors to audit and, and uh, controls and reports on it which was effective in 2004, it was thought to be too broad. It was now uh, superseded by the Auditing Standard 5. And earlier on, when I mentioned it, I said that when we were looking at developing the ICANN technical guidance in ICANN, we leveraged a lot of these um, external um, best practices that were available. So we leveraged that Auditing Standard 5, which was a less burdensome, more compact standard that had been developed by the PCOB. And so the find that the technical guidance for the assurance uh, practitioners in terms of reporting on the assurance engagement on internal control, it actually leverages a lot from the auditing standard five as, as well as um, other things from ISA, 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 um, ISAE and all that. So you can see that the Sabans Oxley Act laid the foundation for much of these reporting requirements that have now come in for both reporters and for assurance practitioners which you see embedded in all the subsequent uh, regulations that have been issued since the, the late 2000s and, and afterwards. All right, all right, that's well taken and that's a very good uh, explanation of that topic. Thank you so much uh, for your response on that topic. Now let's give our audience the privilege uh, so that we can take some of their questions. Uh, those who are here to send questions, if you have one, please send so that we can take your question. The first question for today from the audience is coming from Olaoye Toin, and his question goes to us. If internal control system is weak and overriding by higher authority in an organization, what can I do as an accountant being employed in order to perform my duty effectively and efficiently? Over to you, my okay. guest. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sure that the organization itself would have reporting mechanisms, you know, that have also been in, uh, that have also been instituted. So oftentimes what you find is that there is a, there might not be, there might be a, would I call it a, well, a, a reluctance, you know, to sort of follow some of the reporting mechanisms that have been established and laid down by the organization. So there are, there are, there are, there are, other people within the organization that may be possible to report to. There are, there you may also explore the whistleblowing. Um, most organizations have a, a, a whistleblowing uh, system, a whistleblowing policy. So it, it allows people to be able to speak up and to, and to bring up matters that they may not ordinarily have been able to do. So it's possible that you look in, into, the, into that your circumstance situation in that organization and see what are the channels that are available to me to complain. Maybe I can speak to the board chair. Is there, is there is it possible for me to ask? Can I speak to the head of the internal audit, the chief audit, uh, chief audit executive? You know, this the, the accountant might be sitting in financial control, but is there is there a chief audit executive that I can approach? You know, what other channels is there? Is it is it is, is there for me to is, there, is it possible for me to whistle blow that goes to an independent third party that can look at it and then uh, um, take uh, remedial uh, actions to address the situation? So I'm sure that there are there are the pre channels that you can use to communicate in that sort of circumstance. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your response. I'm sure uh, Tony would have gotten that response and he should be fine with that. The next question is coming from Chibuzo Kore. He says, one major challenge to this application, as you have observed, is the relevant knowledge gap. What steps should an organization take in attempting to close this gap? 
Okay. Yes, the knowledge gap is a, is a, is a significant um, challenge. And um, I would recommend the organization can seek training for its staff. Um, you know, there's a lot of free training that has been going on. Even what we are doing today uh, is, is a form of training that is beneficial. Um, ICANN has organized one before this, uh, you know, in December, the financial reporting uh, organized the Securities and Exchange Commission organized. Most of the firms, the um, you know the accounting firms, they have also organized training. There's a whole lot of training that has gone on um, in the past one year, two years on this topic. I know I've I've also presented, facilitated at several of these things. So one of them is to just seek to get the training, then read the guidance read the guidance these documents are being released the sec guidance the the and the you know the practitioner's guidance read it by the time you read through it it might be a bit uh, thick and all that but if you take it over a week two weeks you can get to the end of it you will be you know quite well informed then go online this is the era where there's so much information online. You can actually literally educate yourself on so many things online these days. So go online, do a lot, a lot of research, and you will find that there's a whole lot of information that you can get that will actually bridge that knowledge gap. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much. And thank you for alluding to the fact that ICANN on Air is also a platform for learning. People should learn from these days and they are learning without any cost. Maybe save cost of data. That's the only thing. But aside that, nothing has been paid for by the audience who benefit from this program. Another question coming from Sikiru Azan. There are PLCs mandated to do annual review of the ICFR, or is it just one off? Thank you for that question, uh, uh, Hassan. It's a, it's a, you are required to do it annually. It's not one off. It's not one off. So going forward, there will be two things that will be done. There will be the audit of the financial statements where they will be checking whether the financial statements have been prepared in accordance with the relevant gap, likely IFRS. That's one thing. And then the auditor will be issuing an opinion on that. But there is the always, there will now be going forward for the PLCs and for the um, for other pie that have been included in FRC definition, there will be going forward a continuous requirement to report separately on internal controls. So the management will need to make the assessment. The practitioner or the auditor for the entities that are in school will need to also now make their report. The only difference is that the management's assessment is giving reasonable assurance. And you know, we've talked about what reasonable is a very high level of assurance. It is saying this thing is effective. It's just like in the financial statements, you're saying these numbers are accurate. For the practitioner, the practitioner will now be, for the ICFR, would be making a limited assurance comment. So it's going to say nothing has come to my attention. Okay. For instance, if nothing came to their attention. If something came to their attention, they will report it as a material weakness. But if there's none, yeah. they will say nothing has come to my attention. That's the only difference. But it's a consistent, uh, it's a, something that starts and going forward. It's not one off. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Because of our time, let's take the final question here from Adiremi Fagbile. He says, can we confidently say now that any structured organization that do not have a structured internal control unit or department should get a qualified audit report from the external auditors? Okay. I think it would depend who is doing that function. So, you know, it's about a task that requires to be done. It's just like you have some organizations where um, you might not have, the organization is not that large, right? To have everything, and there's a, there's a department that is this, there's a department that is that. But the more importantly, is that function happening? 
do you have process owners? What are they? You know, these controls, right? They are owned by what you call the BPOs, the business process owners. Those are the ones that are actually implementing the controls, right? So is who is doing that? Are there business process owners who are implementing these controls? Is there anybody checking them and all of that? Even if they have not a, 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 a structured unit. Of course, it is desirable that the larger the organization is, some of these things are in place. But I'm, I'm just saying that I wouldn't say it will be automatic qualification if those roles that are being executed by people within the organization who are well um, enabled, well equipped, well trained, well placed of sufficient uh, seniority and all of that to execute those, those roles. All right, all right, all right. So in the next 30 minutes, let's quickly see uh, how many more questions we can take with our guest on the show. It's been brilliant uh, so far, and I'm sure you agree with me. Uh, Madam, are, are there... Or is there any form of threshold for internal control over financial reporting? And if there are, what exactly are the, what are those uh, thresholds? Okay, th thank you, thank you very much for that question. No, I wouldn't say there's a threshold. Every organization, it's ISF is essential for any organization, large or small. So it's essential to ensure that their policies, directions, and procedures are put in place are effective. Put in place by board and management are effective. So. It is, there's no, if you meet this, uh, this uh, amount of revenue, then you do as if I know it's essential for everybody. But the FRC guidance on management reports on internal control, which was issued in December 2022 and is effective for um, annual uh, periods ending 31st of December 2024, says it defines who it's applicable for. You know, the SEC one is already applicable for the public limited companies, but the, the FRC one is applicable to pie except small companies i think unit microfinance banks insurance brokers um, non tertiary educational institution and non tertiary health institution and any other that frc will consider to be um, uh, to be excluded um, other than that um, the listed entities the public companies they will apply the state guidance but any excluded entity anybody who is not part of this that desires best practice is encouraged to implement the guidance. Okay, okay. Now, uh, as we cost home, our auditors have always been issuing reports uh, on financial statements, and the nature of their report is critical to the investors' community. Can you please enlighten our viewers on the various kinds of ICFR reports and their potential implications to investors? Thank you very much for that question. So, you know, I mentioned it earlier that the current reporting form is limited assurance or, you know, we can say negative assurance for the practitioner. That is when they look at the controls. And it's because, it, you see, this is a journey. So I'm sure to get to a point where the regulators will require a reasonable assurance opinion or conclusion from the practitioner. But for now, uh, because we're just starting this, uh, uh, this journey, it's a limited and negative assurance. Um, so, uh, but, but for the management, it is a reasonable assurance. So now, in, when forming a conclusion on internal control, the auditor will evaluate all of the evidence that has been obtained. Now, if there is a limitation of scope, for instance, you couldn't get all the information you require, then you issue a qualified conclusion or a disclaimer conclusion. So you have qualified conclusion or disclaimer co conclusion. Um, or maybe you just withdraw from the engagement. But that is where there's a scope limitation. If the subject matter, that is if there is what you consider to be a material weakness that was not remediated, you know, let me just spend one minute and talk briefly on the, on the deficiencies. So you can have control deficiency. You can have um, a significant deficiency or a material weakness. Material weakness is that highest level of weakness whereby the control due to it's not if if it were if it were uh, not if you have a material witness and control means you're exposed to a significant what would have been a material misstatement of the financial statement whether or not it occurred it's not important whether it occurred on it just that the condition was there that could have given rise to that material weakness 
So if you have a, a material weakness in controls, then you have to issue an adverse conclusion. That is where you are now saying that, yes, yeah, something has come to your attention, right? And so you are saying that um, this, you, you can't now say nothing has come to my attention. You say, except for X, Y, Z, which is the, the, the weakness you saw, and then the controls were effective. So, but you would have then issued something that is saying there's not a clean opinion, it's an adverse conclusion. Now, if you didn't notice anything, there was no material weakness, or there were material weaknesses, but they had been remediated on time, and it, the remediation controls had operated effectively for a reasonable time during the period, um, and they're able to reach a conclusion that, okay, all, all is fine. Then you issue a clean report which says nothing has come to my attention, that the internal exactly. controls and procedures uh, put in place are, are not adequate. So those are the forms mm -hmm. of reporting. Oh, okay. Manager, well, on the other hand, would say control is, if, is, is effective. You know, that's the nature of what they would be saying, except if they saw the material weakness. And then okay, first. okay, okay. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, ICANN is always open to ideas that will positively yeah. advance the growth of our members, mm -hmm. the accountancy profession, and the Nigerian business environment. What is your suggestion on filling knowledge gaps and further upskilling our members in high CFR? Okay, thank you very much. I would say three things. One, maybe it can be included in the MCPD, the Mandatory, Mandatory Continuing Professional Development Program. Uh, let's still have more workshops, more sensitization programs like this. And maybe we can also develop a little handbook. I can, can develop a little handbook that just summarizes both guidance and then maybe has a few Q&As so that um, it's just something that's handy for professional colleagues to, to use. Um, other than that, I think individuals themselves should go and develop themselves. Um, I, I talked about it earlier, read the materials, do your own personal research, attend training wherever it's possible. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a very, very wonderful episode with you uh, today, Mrs. Obioma Oba, FCA, a partner assurance services, PWC. Thanks for coming on the show today and for sharing your world of experience with our members and friends of the Institute. We say thank you so much for coming. We appreciate you. It has been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And we hope that when next we also call upon you, uh, you are working to our goals. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you very thank much. You. Have a good evening. Okay, so uh, in the next few minutes I have, let me quickly take the announcements uh, that I have here for you. Uh, ICANN has appointed a new registrar chief executive in person of uh, Dr. Musiba Olari Olasunkomi, FCA. His appointment took effect from February 1st, 2024. Welcome the new registrar on board and we pray for strength and uh, grace for more exploits for him. Uh, the next MPCD training program comes up on Wednesday, February 28th to Thursday, February 29, 2024 in consultancy sector. It is a virtual training and the cost is 20,000 Naira. Go ahead and register today so you can be part of this MCPD training program. Also, I can, in collaboration with Babcock University, Lishan Remo, Ogun State, and African Accounting and Finance Association, AFA, is organizing a ninth annual international academic conference on accounting and finance. The team is building a viral economy through industrial revolution, technology advancement, and creative capacity development. The date is Tuesday, February 13th, to Thursday, February 15, 2024. And the venue is Babcock University, Elishan Remo, Ogun State. Please register for this program and be part of it. It promises uh, to be highly educative. Also, the March 2024 ATWA examination date is already announced. The Tuesday, March 26 to March 27, 2024 is the date and registration is ongoing. Tell all our ATWA members to quickly go ahead and register. And also, lastly, the Institute is recruiting to fill the following positions. Manager Accountancy, Learning and Development, Manager Technical Excellence. The flyers are all around. Check for these flyers if you are qualified because nobody stops you to send in your 
application. And now, dear personal colleagues, and that will be the show uh, for today. And you will agree with me that today's program is worthwhile and very instructive. Uh, till I come your way again with another guest, another topic, topical issue, I will say you should be stay safe and stay sound. On behalf of the editorial team and the producers, I remain to see Akimumi FCA saying thank you for watching and bye for now.